Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Selections from the anthropologist Ruth Benedict's article, Anthropology and the Abnormal, are often anthologized as a defense of ethical relativism. And in it, Benedict is arguing for a type of ethical relativism that we typically call cultural relativism, which says that what is wrong or what is right, what is good or what is bad, what is uh, affirmed as, as ethically valuable or as the opposite, is going to vary from culture to culture in such a way that there really is nothing that you can say um, cuts across every single culture in, in a way as to provide an absolute ethical norm. Instead, what she is saying is that different cultures provide different, you might say, codes or matrices, however you want to think about it. She doesn't uh, tie herself to any particular language here. And those determine what the people within that culture view as right or wrong, good or bad, just or unjust, pick whatever other moral language that you like. Now, she does acknowledge an incredible diversity of human beings as individuals within cultures, but the culture provides a sort of framework in which they have to find their place or perhaps not find their place and be considered abnormal. She's going to frame this in terms of the categories of normality and abnormality, not to say that every culture uses those terms, of course, but she says that our modern Western culture, at least within, you know, more or less advanced, literate, civilized areas, tends now to think of, of those as the most important terms. And she, she also cautions, she says, modern civilization from the point of view that we have becomes not a necessary pinnacle of human achievement, but a one entry in a long series of possible adjustments. She views civilizations, cultures, however you want to think about them, societies, as being akin to languages which use a common phonemic manifold, that is the, the apparatus that we are given as human beings, which is really quite remarkable in its own uh, respect, but they, they play upon it differently so that some languages will not in fact use certain sounds or they may differentiate things in ways that, that we don't distinguish as in, for example, Mandarin, where you know the place, the location within the mouth for what would, in, for an English speaker, be the same sound, like j and r, uh, it, it means a different sound. It signifies something different. And you can say the same thing for cultures. She also thinks they're like languages in that they develop over time without anybody saying, aha, we want to do exactly this, or even when they do make deliberate decisions about that, it, it, it becomes just part Part of the process. And so she talks, as many anthropologists will do, about custom and habit as being established. She thinks that normality and abnormality are in fact culturally defined and determined. And so if we frame it in terms of abnormality and normality, um, or deviancy is another term that she uses for abnormality, then we are going to arrive at the, the point where we can see this in a relativistic way. So she says here uh, about halfway through, 
every society, beginning with some inclination in one direction or another, carries its preference farther and farther, integrating itself more and more completely on this basis, discarding those types of behaviors that are uncongenial. And so convert the most valued traits of our normal individuals in our society have been looked on in differently organized cultures as aberrant. Normality, she says, in short, within a very wide range is culturally defined. It is primarily a term for the socially elaborated segment of human behavior in any culture. An abnormality, a term for that the segment that particular civilization does not use, they, they don't like. That doesn't mean that people won't show up within that segment, but they're viewed as being outside. They're viewed as being wrong, as deviant, as, as uh, sometimes you know objects of fear or anger or derision. She says, um, here we go. We don't make the mistake any longer of deriving the morality of our locality and decade directly from the inevitable constitution of human nature. We don't elevate it to the dignity of a first principle. Obviously, she's not speaking for everybody in modern Western culture, but she is speaking for a certain group. She says, we recognize that morality differs in every society and is a convenient term for what? For socially approved habits. So this is a very clear relativistic standpoint, um, viewing morality or ethics or however you want to put it as simply what has become established and approved within a given social framework, which means that it's relative to that social framework. She goes on and says, mankind has always preferred to say it is a morally good thing rather than it is habitual. And the fact of this preference is matter enough for a critical science of ethics. But historically, the two phases, phrases are synonymous. So the, here's where she says the concept of the normal is properly a variant of the concept of the good. It is that which society has approved. Normal action is one which falls well within the limits of expected behavior. Its variability is a function of the variability of behavior patterns, and it can never be wholly divorced from a consideration of culturally institutionalized types of behavior. So what is good from this standpoint will vary from place to place, from location to location. And most importantly, since you can take people out of their place, by culture by the set of assumptions and practices and shared um, meanings that define a particular people, culture, society, well, however you want to frame it. So cultures then determine what personality traits or what actions, what motives, what explanatory uh, accounts people give of their behaviors, what desires, and everything else that falls into the moral range, could be objects, could be books, which of those count as normal and which count as abnormal. So she grants that there are going to be a lot of variants, and she brings up examples of people who actually don't fit into other cultures. One thing that we should mention as a side note is Benedict does not assume at all that every culture is, you know, because it's got its own uh, thing is always in harmony with itself as opposed to us modern Westerners who have lost our roots or anything like that. Every single culture is facing the same basic problem, which is that it's got a code and some people because of their nature, because of quirks about their, their experiences. Some people fit solidly into that. Other people are on the outside. And then there's mechanisms by which they get people on one side or another. Indoctrination, catechesis, modeling, you know, uh, modifying people's behavior until, you know, they, they fake it till they make it. All of those are possibilities. And the anguish that, that human beings often feel when they don't sense themselves as fitting into the normal, that occurs in her view in practically every culture as well. So every culture has, you know, some sort of manifold, you might say, and then human beings have this variability. Some of them are more outgoing. Some of them are more reflective. Some of them are more 
uh, risk averse. We could go on and on and on about these different traits or complexes. The cultures themselves tend to favor some of these at the expense of others. And every culture, according to her, does this. So she gives several examples of these traits. She says, um, uh, every culture is more or less an elaborate working out of the potentialities of the segment it has chosen insofar as the civilization is well integrated and consistent within itself. It will tend to carry farther and farther according to its nature, its initial impulse towards a particular type of action. So cultures are understood as dynamic and as developmental. She says, from the point of view of any other culture, these elaborations will include more and more extreme and aberrant traits. Notice, from the perspective of outsiders who have their own culture, the continual ongoing development of, of this culture is going to seem aberrant. We might use as an example uh, the development of, of music, you know, and you could think of sub genres of different kinds of rock, and then think of heavy metal, and then think of the development from the 90s, really, onward, of all the many different genres of metal, so that for some people, heavy metal doesn't signify classic 1970s, 80s heavy metal, or the, the bands influenced by that, but signifies perhaps Scandinavian death metal, some, some very small niche where people are always trying to go further and further and further. Right? Even within the, the normal, uh, in this case, realm of traditional heavy metal, there was an ongoing development. You know, the introduction of distortion pedals. Instead of having to achieve distortion by putting you know, your guitar closer to the amp and having it overdriven. Right? You can hear a difference between 1970s and 1980s metal within the same band. Right? So these provide us with easy to understand examples and you can elaborate your own examples uh, using contemporary uh, instances uh, as well, provided you can think about how a culture could, could develop itself further. She talks about four cultures and four sets of practices, uh, motivational structures, however you want to think about them, that tie in with normality and abnormality and deviancy, comparing them to Western culture and then comparing them to some degree against each other. She talks very briefly about trance phenomena and catalepsis going into a kind of a, a, a somnolent uh, state. And she says that within our society, we regard that as quite aberrant. If somebody is just staring off into space. We interrupt them and ask them, what are you thinking about? But in India, where this is actually an integral part of the culture, not only because of uh, religious and philosophical practices, but because of daily, day in sort of uh, things going on, and because it's also part of a developmental structure, you know, in, in early years, you're supposed to be oriented towards things of the world. In later years, you're supposed to be oriented towards liberation, uh, towards human development. Well, then in, in that case, that could be normal behavior and not cause anyone to bat an eye. She also talks about uh, something that's been changing to some degree, can, you know, quite a bit in our own culture, homosexuality. At the time that she's writing, it's viewed as deeply aberrant, and we've seen this changing within many segments of modern society. For example, uh, homosexuality no longer being treated by the psychiatric establishment as a disorder, but rather as something that, that's available for people. It moved out of aberrancy or abnormality into normality, at least in some areas. At other points, the, the clock is swinging back. The example that she brings up about a culture that actually uh, incorporates this and allows for different orientations to be developed, in some respect, fits what we now you know, would call homosexuality, but it also fits into um, the entire notion of gender and being transgendered, because she talks about the uh, Berdash uh, conception, which is found in some American uh, Indian tribes, 
Um, she talks about <clears throat> men, women who are men at puberty or thereafter took the dress and occupations, uh, or men who at puberty or thereafter took the dress and occupations of women. Sometimes they married other men and lived with them. Sometimes they were men with no inversion, persons of weak sexual endowment who chose this role to avoid the jeers of the women. The Burdaches were never regarded as first-rate supernatural powers, as similar men and women were in Siberia, but rather as leaders in women occupations, good healers in certain diseases, or among certain tribes as the genial organizers of social affairs. And here's the key point that she's saying. In any case, they were socially placed. They were not left exposed to the conflicts that visit the deviant, who is excluded from participation in the recognized patterns of his society. There was a place for this person. If you had uh, certain you know, bents or behaviors, somebody could say, well, maybe you're over here, and that's okay, right? So in our society, until very recently, that would not have been okay. And even in large parts of our contemporary modern society, there are many people who feel that that's not okay as well. She brings up another example from Melanesia, where paranoiac tendencies are taken to an extreme that we would probably consider to be mental illness, but for the people there, that's considered rationality. And our over-trusting genial behavior would be viewed as a form of deviancy. She talks about, um, here we go, a society built on traits that we regard as beyond the border of paranoia. In this tribe, the exogamic groups, that is marrying uh, outside of their, their group, look upon each other as prime manipulators of black magic so that one marries always into an enemy group which remains for life one's deadly and unappeasable foes. They look upon a good garden crop as a confession of theft. Everyone is engaged in making magic to induce into their garden the productiveness of their neighbors. Therefore, no secrecy in the island is so rigidly insisted on as the secrecy of a man's harvesting of his yams. Their preoccupation with poisoning is constant. No woman ever leaves her cooking pot for a moment unattended. Even the great affinial economic exchanges that are characteristic of this Melanesian culture are quite altered in Dobu since they are incompatible with this fear and distrust that pervades the culture. And she actually talks about a deviant there, a person who from birth on didn't adopt this paranoic structure and behaved friend in a friendly way, in a charitable way to their neighbors, and they were viewed as somebody, you know, totally wrong-headed. Whereas we would look at that as, as being quite affable. She talks also about uh, the uh, tribes in, in the American Northwest and um, some of the strange murderous, as we would call it, behavior that, that comes about uh, because of that. Um, and she says, well, you know, within their culture, that actually makes some sense. She says, um, among the Quackutal, it did not matter whether a relative had died in bed of disease or the hand of an enemy. In either case, death was an affront, an insult, to be wiped out by the death of another person. The fact that one had been caused to mourn was proof that one had been put upon. A very you know, strange perspective from our part, and, as she points out, a strange perspective from the part of other Native American tribes. So she brings up the fact that somebody from a Plains Indian tribe who would not retaliate, for example, if his, his wife was taken from him, would be looked at as an idiot by, by these other tribes. He would be viewed as the deviant, whereas he would have a hard time understanding their hyper-aggressivity and willingness to seemingly take offense about anything. Uh, to the point where they would kill people. So all of these are ways of elaborating culture. And if, if Benedict is correct in her views, then good or bad, right or wrong, would in fact be dependent on what is considered normal or abnormal in cultures. And there wouldn't be any one single overarching culture that would determine that. Even if there are, you know, disciplines such as anthropology coming largely out of the uh, modern West, 
That would only be one perspective among others. 